Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Hans Kundanani. I am the director of the Europe program at, at Chatham House, and I'd like to welcome you all to this uh, special RSA online event. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted uh, to be talking today to Professor Helen Thompson. She's the uh, Professor of Political Economy at the University of Cambridge, where her research focuses on the political economy of energy and the long history of the democratic, economic and geopolitical disruptions of the 21st century. Um, many of you will know her from the podcast Talking Politics. Um, she's also a contributing writer to The New Statesman. Um, and today we're going to discuss Helen's new book, Disorder, Hard Times in the 21st Century, um, which is uh, a very wide ranging um, uh, examination of the tumultuous political times that we're living through. Um, it's, there's a lot in the book um, and um, we've only got about 45 minutes or so, so I think we're probably only going to scratch the surface, uh, Helen. Um, I think what one of the things that makes this book so unique um, and so important um, is the way that it combines these three different dimensions or realms or stories that are often treated um, separately. So in particular, um, there's a geopolitical story focusing particularly um, on energy. Um, then secondly, there's an economic story. Uh, and then thirdly and finally, there's, there's a democratic story. Um, and it seems to me that there are lots of books around that look, and, look at each, you know, each of those three um, dimensions or stories individually. There are also quite a few books, I think, that combine the geopolitical and the economic um, but as I say, I think what makes this book very unique is, is that it also brings in the democratic story. Um, and so um, I think um, we'll try to uh, discuss each of those three and, and how they interact, which I think is probably the most interesting uh, part of, of the book. Um, I guess, though, we have to start with Ukraine because we're having this conversation um, in the middle of this extraordinary um, crisis and, and war. Um, which is escalating hour by hour, day by day. Um, and energy is a big part of that story. Um, and so I wonder, Helen, if we could start by, um, by, by maybe you could tell us a little bit about how you understand the, um, the, you know, the way in which the story you tell in the book, particularly about energy, helps us understand um, what's going on uh, in the Ukraine crisis right now? Well, obviously, I, I, I don't think that energy is the, the central reason at all um, why Putin has decided that um, to invade um, Ukraine in the way in which he um, does, has, sorry. But energy is the context in which everything to do with this war is um, happening, including the possibilities for the European Union and the United States and NATO in responding to Putin's um, action. And I think in, in order to see this, we need to in some ways go back to the middle of the 1950s and we need to go back to the, the Suez crisis and what was essentially this moment when West European countries all found that having been encouraged by the United States to rely on Middle Eastern oil, in the post-war world, that actually the United States was willing to use its financial power in order to circumscribe, in the case of Suez moment, lethally, the way in which the West European countries could defend what they took to be their ensuing oil interests in the, the Middle East. And there was one big, in the end, response, I think, from the Western European countries to the Suez um, crisis, which was to turn to Soviet oil. That had essentially been taboo before then because of the, um, the Cold War. Uh, and what we see is, is that oil relationship develops through the 1960s. And crucially, from the late 60s, early 70s, it extends to gas. Uh, and that's particularly important in the case of West Germany. And this really, I think, becomes the energy relationship between what is then the Soviet Union and West Germany becomes the base, the material basis, if you like, of Ostpolitik, the whole way in which West German um, foreign policy was recast um, by Willy um, Brandt, the Social Democratic um, Chancellor. And, and this relationship between Europe and uh, Western Europe and 
the, what would become Russia continues into the post-Cold War world. It continues beyond the dissolution of the Soviet um, Union. But something fundamental changes at that point because it's not only is it no longer a relationship between the Soviet Union and Western European um, countries, but between Russia and the West European um, countries. But now these pipelines, both the oil and the gas um, pipelines that had been built, now go through Ukraine as an independent country rather than Ukraine as a part of the, the Soviet Union. And from the point of view of Russian governments, and this, I have to say, um, was a concern of Russian governments before Putin came to, to, to power, this was a problem. This turned Ukraine into a risk for them. What happened in Ukraine was a risk um, for their sense of Russian state energy interests. When Putin comes into um, power, he pretty systematically, I'd say for two decades now, has tried to cut out Ukraine out of the transit system of Ukraine, sorry, of, of, of um, Russian gas. He wanted pipelines that went first under the Black Sea. He wanted pipelines that went under the Baltic Sea, which were the two Nord Stream um, pipelines. And because in the case of the northern ones, so the ones that go under the Baltic Sea, that this has been um, accepted in some sense for a long time as a German um, sort of corporate necessity, um, this very much um, framed the way in which the Germans in particular thought about EU relations with Russia and what the Germans think about EU relations with Russia is obviously more consequential in the end than what any other country um, thinks um, about them. So from Putin's point of view, the, the problem of Ukraine as a transit state has been part of the justification for what he's done in Ukraine. If you look at the, the comments which he um, made um, a few, the speech in which he made a few weeks ago, he complained about the terrible state of the pipelines in Ukraine and nobody could expect Russian gas to be sent um, down them. Um, but it's also a reason, both the dependency on Russian imports and the ways in which the pipelines work is, uh, is a constraint, a serious constraint on the way in which the European Union and consequently NATO can deal with this, this war. That's really neat. So in other words, the, the sort of Ukraine part of this problem um, goes back to the end of the Cold War and the independence of, of Ukraine um, after the end of the Soviet Union. Um, and then the, the way in which Europeans more generally have become dependent on, on Russia um, for energy goes back to Suez. Um, I would love to get more into German foreign policy, and maybe we'll do that a bit later on. But I'm struck by the Suez point, though, because um, in, a, in a way, um, isn't something quite similar happening now? Several people have made this uh, comparison in, in the last few days that what the United States and more broadly, I suppose, the West is trying to do to Russia now with some of the economic sanctions, particularly the central bank sanctions, is somewhat analogous to what the United States did to France and, 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 and Britain in the, in the Suez crisis, in terms of a sort of geoeconomic, you know, in particular trying to sort of force, you know, a crash in the ruble and so on. No, I mean, absolutely. I mean, the, 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 I mean, obviously they weren't called sanctions as such that were being imposed upon um, Britain um, in, in particular, but essentially um, the Eisenhower administration made it so difficult in terms of the sterling problems that the um, Eden, Anthony Eden's government um, was um, facing that he had no alternative but to, to make a, um, a volt farce uh, and to, to, to stop the, the military uh, action. I think that everybody understood um, that Britain's vulnerability in the, in the position in, in, in the situation came from the vulnerability of its currency. I think that what's often misunderstood about the Suez crisis is that, in some sense, you know, I was taught this narrative that it's this humiliating moment um, for the British because um, they finally have to face up to the fact that they're no longer an imperial power and that they've got you know, these deluded pretensions of um, grand grandeur. But actually, the Americans have been relying upon the British to exercise military power in the Middle East. It was supposed to be Britain in its imperial um, role that was supposed to defend um, Western energy interests um, in, the, um, in the Middle East. And for a set of somewhat understandable 
um, reasons, um, Eisenhower decided that when um, Britain allied with France and Israel to defend those interests, that it was unacceptable. I think Eisenhower later came to regret um, that what he had um, done. But British weakness wasn't its imperial military weakness at that point. It could have succeeded with military um, operation. British weakness was its financial weakness, yeah. was the weakness of um, sterling. Now, this was tied to some en energy questions, too, because being able to pay for oil in sterling was very important to the British um, at that point. They were in a privileged position in regard to um, that compared to other West European um, countries. Um, but the United States was able to impose its will on Britain and, and, and then as a consequence on France and Israel in, in 1956 because of um, the financial pressure, the huge financial pressure um, that would have ensued if Eden hadn't done what Eisenhower asked him to do. So that in turn opens up another really interesting question about the relationship between or the sort of continuity, discontinuity between sort of British imperialism and American power, some would say American imperialism. Um, but, you know, so I think in a way, we, you know, and you do this in, your, in, in, in the book is to go back even further in terms of the energy story to the sort of, I suppose, the uh, transition from coal to oil, but then also how that coincides with the rise of American power. Um, so can you maybe just say a little bit about that, you know, wh where, where the energy story starts? Because it, it goes even back, it goes back even further than Suez, doesn't it? No, absolutely. I mean, I think that, I think the energy story that I'm telling really begins in the beginning of the 20th century. I've, I've got a, a prelude at the end of the, 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 the 19th century, but I think that the, 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 the crucial watershed is at the beginning of the, the 20th century when everybody in the great powers, among the great powers, certainly the British and the Americans who are sort of becoming a great power um, at this point, understand that the future is going to be oil-based navies. And that is what first in the first instance makes um, oil um, important. And this is a, Churchill that makes the transition in the British case. Absolutely. Right? Churchill drives um, the British away from coal, from the coal based Navy to an oil based um, Navy. And this is really consequential because in the age of coal, obviously, Britain had an abundant domestic supply. Um, it didn't need to import this from um, anywhere. It didn't need to use its imperial power anywhere in the world in order to access coal. In the age of oil, as, or as the age of oil begins, would be a better way of, uh, of putting um, that. That isn't the case at all. Britain doesn't have any oil. Um, and in its uh, empire at that point, um, it, there isn't much either. Its great hope is, is that Iran is going to, or Persia is it then, is, is, is going to provide oil to um, Britain in the in the future and, and, and Britain is fighting at that point in Persia as it has a sphere of influence in in Persia and Russia effectively has a sphere of influence um, in um, Persia so the, the story at the beginning of the 20th century I think is is there are two oil producers big oil producers um, one is the United States and one is Russia and they are going to be the two powers that will dominate the much of the the the, the, the 20th century and the European powers, with the exception of um, Austria-Hungary, Hungary, where there is oil in, in Galicia, but it's not being used very um, effectively, um, you know, are terrified by this world because they do, I think, understand quite quickly. It's one that puts European countries at an immense um, disadvantage. And so if we look at the period sort of after the First World War, in which American oil has been pretty important, so the interwar period between the, the two, between the, the two world wars, I think you can see all the European countries, including Germany, um, before Hitler came to um, power, trying to find a way around this problem of what do we do in a world in which we are dependent upon supply from the United States, from the Western Hemisphere in general, and the United States in particular, and they want alternatives. For Britain and France, that means using their constructing empires in the in, in 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 the middle east and those attempts all fail they, they fail obviously in, in very different ways if we're talking about the germany story um by 1945 and we're talking about the british and the french story by 1945 but what's striking is is that all of the these countries at different points including um britain um for a while have imported soviet oil so this idea that 
it was okay to do oil trade with the Soviet Union, you know, is there at different points in the 19, from the latter part of the 1920s and through the um, 1930s. It's the Cold War that changes that because the Americans in particular, they, they don't want West European countries to be importing oil from the Soviet Union. By the time we get to like 1947, um, let's say, and at the same time, they don't want the West European countries to be importing oil from the Western Hemisphere and from the United States in particular, because they're now worried about future supplies. So they encourage the Middle Eastern oil dependency of the West European countries. And then when Britain and France act to defend those interests, as they understand them in the Suez crisis, then Eisenhower says, no, you're not supposed to do it that way. <laughs> and I think that's such a seismic shock in Western Europe. Not least actually in Germany, which obviously hasn't been party to the, 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 the military operation in, in, in 1956, that there have to be alternatives. I mean, one alternative that's pursued is obviously nuclear power, the European atomic energy um, community. But then, as we know, in the 1970s, there's a big backlash in West Germany against nuclear power. The thing that sticks after Suez in terms of looking for an alternative is the beginning of the energy relationship with the Soviet Union. And then that then that gets carries through into the post Cold War world, but with this crucial difference in that those pipelines are now going through independent countries, including actually Belarus as well as um, Ukraine, and they're not just going Soviet Union, Eastern Europe, Western Europe. Yeah. Um, and obviously, it's in the eighties that those pipelines between Germany, uh, West Germany at the time, and, and the Soviet Union begin as sort of forerunners of, of the later sort of Nord Stream and so on. Um, but can I press you a bit on on the? Um, I suppose to, to what extent these developments in terms of energy um, shape the story of international politics or geopolitics in the last century. Um, and in particular, the extent to which they shape, have shaped, will shape US foreign policy, you know, given that this period, you know, coincides with, you know, the sort of rise of the United States, and then particularly after World War II, um, its sort of global role, I suppose. Um, and to, to what extent is that being, being driven by, by um, this, uh, this energy story? And in particular, you know, the, you described the way that the US goes from being um, energy independent to then being energy dependent to now again approaching energy inde independence. Um, and so, you know, my, my question would be, you know, to, to what extent, you know, will that now change US foreign policy going forward? Yeah, I mean, I think that there's a big juncture in, in the 1970s. Uh, that it's just a, a seismic change in the world and um, when the United States has to be uh, um, become a significant oil importer and it quite quickly would be, will become from the 70s the, the world's largest oil um, importer given the the size of American um, oil demand which in terms of sort of per capita you know is on another level pretty much to everybody else's and I think that we can see how that dependency, a lot of which means importing oil from the Middle East, um, really causes a whole set of never solved problems for the Americans about what to do about the Middle East. And they're made a lot worse at the late 1970s after the Iranian revolution, yeah. um, because a lot had been bet in the first part of the 70s by Richard Nixon's administration on a relationship with Iran, including an energy yeah. relationship. Um, with Iran and, and I think you West can Germany to go back to West Germany that was also importing a lot of, um, of oil from Iran right? absolutely and I think you can then run you can run a story about Western difficulties in the Middle East that runs from then through the 70s um, all the way through um, to the second um, Iraq war and its failure in a, in a number of um, yeah. respects and obviously there were different there's different languages one can use to describe that but one way might be to see to see it as how Washington became more ambitious in the 1990s about trying to essentially turn the middle Middle East into an American sphere of influence and then that came crashing down um, with the um, what happened in the second Iraq 
um, war. Obviously, that didn't actually take the United States out of the, the Middle East. I mean, um, Obama had got Iraq, American troops out of Iraq in 2011, and then he was they were back, not troops, but the United States was back in a war, obviously, um, with ISIS only a few years later, covering both Iraq and um, Syria. But the big change that happens in the 2010s is the shale, oil and gas um, boom. Now, on the one hand, um, this is a, a considerably to the Americans' advantage. It makes sort of dealing with that mess that they've managed to make in the, in the Middle East somewhat easier because they think that they can disentangle, so they can disengage, though they never disengage from providing naval security in the, in the, um, in the Persian Gulf. It also makes it easier, much easier to persuade the European Union that there should be sanctions on Iran in 2011. Yeah. And those sanctions hurt Iran's um, oil exporting capacity, and that makes it possible for the Obama administration to pursue the Iran nuclear um, deal in 2015. Um, but the very nature of the shale boom and the fact that it turns the United States into, in time, in the 2010s, the world's largest oil producer, means that Saudi Arabia um, now has a competitor, not just Russia, which it's used to competing with for market share, but American shale um, producers um, too. So the American shale boom turns out to be extraordinarily disruptive of the, the US-Saudi relationship. And indeed, from late 2014, the Saudis effectively, even though they're obviously in some, it's still in an alliance with, 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 Saudi, sorry, with the United States in a number of ways, they try to bankrupt shale oil um, producers in order in, in order to establish um, Saudi primacy in the oil oil market again, so that's incredibly disruptive. On the other side, is is what happens is is that with the shale gas boom, is is that the United States can now compete with selling gas um, to Europe with Russia, um, and this allows the possibility of really pressuring European countries. Um, about their dependency on Russian gas and to pressure them about which pipelines the gas is um, coming um, down. So the Obama administration is successful in bringing one of these pipelines, South Stream, one that went under the, would have gone under the um, Black Sea into Bulgaria, is successful in bringing that to an end. Um, but it's not, the Trump administration um, tries very hard, as we know, to bring Nord Stream, the second Nord Stream pipeline going under the Baltic Sea um, to an end. But it's a lot, shall we say, easier to take on the Bulgarian government about this than it is to take on the, the German government um, about this. Yeah. And at the same time, the Germans have got an answer back to the Americans, which is, oh, you're not really worried about Nord Stream 2. You're not really worried about our gas dependency on Russia. You're just interested in your shale gas producers selling liquid natural gas imports um to us so what we see is is i think that the united states can actually exercise significantly more energy power in europe than was the case previously but yeah. it's not really decisive uh, and in the end when biden comes in although it looked like i must admit i was a bit taken by surprise when he the biden administration last spring decided to remove the Nord Stream 2 sanctions that were um, in place biden administration backed away from that fight yeah. Yeah. So this brings us right back to the current um, current crisis, because obviously, you know, in the last week, um, Germany has um, at least suspended the certification for Nord Stream 2 um, under heavy pressure from from the US. Um, but um, to go back to sort of the, the US foreign policy and the role of, of energy in that um, and, and how that plays into the current crisis. In a way, I mean, is, is what you're saying um, or the implication of, of what you write in the book that, you know, so if, if, if the United States is now becoming, you know, more independent in energy terms because of, of shale, oil and gas as this game changer, as, as you said, um, you know, that in a sense, I, mean, I guess the simplistic version would be to say that sort of means it needs to worry less about the Middle East, there's still Israel and so on, but, but it has less reason to be involved in the Middle East. 
um, but perhaps also less um, incentive um, to worry about um, about uh, European dependence on on Russian energy. So, um, to, how does that explain what's going on right now in terms of in terms of um, the the sort of U.S. approach to this uh, under Biden? Is this is this driven by other concerns other than the energy? I mean, is the energy story part of what's driving U.S. policy right now? You seem to suggest a minute ago that that you know, the, the shale revolution has enabled the US to exert greater pressure on Europeans. But why would they do that right now? Um, is it not more for political reasons rather than energy reasons? Yeah, I think that there's a juncture here um, with the Biden administration. Um, I think that if you go back to the, the very end of like 2019, you can see the Trump administration really um, perhaps even more so the Republican con you know, run Congress, um, pushing these sanctions against Nord Stream, uh, at, that actually, Nord Stream 2, that, um, that actually did bring work on, the, on that pipeline to a halt before the pipeline had actually been um, finished. And the reason why the US was able to make those sanctions effective was because of the um, the threats that were made to the European companies that were participating in building, finishing the pipeline, essentially to be cut out of the American access to the American financial um, system. So I think it is important to see that that there is a change that comes with the, the Biden administration, which is to say, essentially, we will let this be, um, that we're not going back, um, even to the policy of the Obama administration, um, which had pressurized over the South Stream um, pipeline successfully. We're not going back to that. And the reason that we're not going um, back to that is essentially because what matters actually is China. Yeah. And the, the hope, which I have to say I thought was delusional from the start, would, was that if the Germans were essentially, to put it crudely, given what they wanted about Nord Stream, that they would be more accommodating about a, yeah. um, a more confrontational policy with China. Yeah. But actually the same, in a way, commercial logic that underpinned Nord Stream, underpinned Germany's relationship with, economic relationship with China. So- Strong, it, It's even stronger, isn't it? I mean, yeah, the, in the lots of ways it's even stronger. It's infinitely greater. I think the other thing we, we, we have to remember is, is that for the Biden administration, it didn't want to have to engage in fossil fuel energy geopolitics, I think. I mean, I don't think it assumed, was naive enough to assume the whole set of issues was were going to go away. But Biden obviously wanted to be a climate change president. Uh, he didn't want to use American energy power in the way in which the shale, or as the shale and gas boom had allowed for, in the ways of his two um, predecessors, his concern was, how do we get away from fossil fuel energy uh, as um, quickly as possible? The difficulty, and this is where American foreign policy is really constrained in this respect, is, is that Biden didn't then say, the corollary of that is, is we will allow um, energy prices to rise if necessary. Right. He absolutely wanted a price strategy still. So every time the oil prices were going above about $75 a barrel, I should say that now they're more like $100 um, a barrel, then, the, then, then Biden was, and, and administration officials were putting pressure on OPEC plus, which in, essentially at its heart or center has both Saudi Arabia and Russia to increase production, to bring um, prices down. And the only way I think really that the whole package of positions that the Biden administration took could be made to could have gone together would be if he'd succeeded early in getting a new Iran nuclear deal and getting a, a, a Iran back into a nuclear uh, controls on its nuclear development and in exchange um, Iran would have the restrictions on its oil exporting capacity or its ability to exp export um, um, oil um, removed and so Iranian supply could make up for the the the, the could, could make up for the shortfall um, essentially. 
But as we know, it's not been possible to resurrect the Iran um, nuclear um, deal. I would say if we bear in mind that the last, the first Iran nuclear deal was actually quite dependent on Putin's support for it, uh, his willingness to put pressure on the Iranian regime to agree it, then the conditions that made it possible last time simply don't exist. But without it, then Biden's got a domestic problem of high oil prices that he doesn't really know what to do with. That pushes him back into, I would say, well, we've got to try and persuade yeah. OPEC plus to increase production. But how do you do that in, in the context um, of um, US Russia relations now being what they are because of the war in Ukraine? Yeah. Yeah. So in other words, the United States is being pulled in two different directions. On the one hand, wanting to, to confront Russia, but at the same time, needing to cooperate with Russia on climate change and on things like um, the Iran deal. Um, let's um, maybe explore the, the economic uh, dimension of this a little bit more, because actually, I think one of the interesting things um, in the um, in the last few days has been this way in which um, energy and particularly some of the sort of financial sanctions um, that have been imposed on, on Russia have sort of interacted. I'm thinking particularly of, of you know, banning uh, Russia or Russian banks from SWIFT, um, you know, which um, is very interconnected with this, with this, um, with this question of, of Russian energy um, exports. So can you explain, explain how, a little bit how you think the, the, um, the energy story and the economic story uh, fit together? Yeah, I mean, on that particular um, point, what was pretty clear is, is that energy transactions are going to be exempt um, from the ways in which Russia is, um, is excluded from um, SWIFT. They're going to be, work, they're going to be work away, work, yeah. they're just going to be um, worked around. Um, because if you stop off, if you, if you stop it being possible to pay Russia for its oil and gas, then there won't be any oil and gas coming. And then that is just far too big a shock, I think, for yeah. either Germany or Italy in particular um, to um, absorb. Yeah. Which is quite extraordinary. I don't think the Americans want that either. It's quite extraordinary, though, isn't it? That, that we're sort of um, increasingly talking and perhaps moving towards a essentially a war between NATO and Russia while continuing to export energy to import energy from Russia. And I think the figure I saw in the last couple of days was we're sending $700 million a day to, to Russia, while apparently we're, we're moving, as I say, uh, escalating towards, towards a war with Russia. Is that sustainable? I think it may be, actually. <laughs> um, strangely, I mean, I think, though, that what you've just described is actually, though, a, a story with a, you know, a very long history. Um, you know, going back into the you know the first half of sorry the the, the second half of the the twentieth century after the the Second World War and the um, beginnings um, of the 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 Cold War is is that NATO has never got to grips um, with the energy security um, issue. NATO was formed, as we know, to deal with the situation in Europe, to deal um, with what was taken to be the Soviet threat. Um, in um, Europe um, and at the same time is is that the West European countries as we've already um, talked about were actually dependent for their energy, a crucial energy resource on another part of the world the Middle East and um, that the Americans didn't want to get involved in that where Britain was the the dominant Western um, power but whilst it could still project military power had this ultimately immense financial vulnerability um, around um, sterling. It was because of the fact that the Middle East did matter that Turkey became a NATO member. It wasn't initially a NATO member, it joined a, a few years um, later, but there were always NATO members, including I think yeah. Germany and West Germany and France that were never that keen on right. Turkish membership of um, NATO. So every time an energy question up, an energy security question came up, you can see that there's just a, a considerable incoherence in NATO's um, 
position, not least because it always yeah. exposed this fault line that ran through Turkey's yeah. um, membership. So I, I don't think we should be surprised that that we can see this now because I think it's been actually yeah. actually there um, but, since the beginning. But isn't this a little different in the sense that you know a Cold War with energy interdependence is is one thing, but this is increasingly sort of heating up. Um, well, I think that the difference, I mean, one of the things that, that, that really, you know, is, 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 um, is quite terrifying in a way, in fact, not just in a way, um, is that this issue of how much economic damage can be inflicted on Russia whilst doing this kind of financial escalation, yeah. whilst trying to keep energy out of it, yeah. at the same time in which Putin is willing to talk the language of nuclear um, weapons that's a pretty lethal yeah. mix yeah i mean it's interesting that if you go back to the Suez crisis there is a nuclear element to the to the Suez crisis because at a certain point sort of sort of right towards the end actually just before the um eden backs down is that khrushchev the soviet um premier has basically said that he will obliterate Israel and drop nuclear bombs on um, Britain and France if that they don't retreat. And the Americans, Eisenhower ends up having to say that, well, there will be retaliation um, and that um, Britain and France will be defended with nuclear weapons if, if, if that scenario were to um, occur. So I wouldn't say it's the first time that we've got the nuclear, the finance and the energy all nuclear war, I mean by that, all tangled up um, with um, each other. Um, but it was also the case, almost certainly in 1956, that Khrushchev was bluffing, given the state of Soviet nuclear missiles at the time. I mean, as a nuclear power, so Russia is, um, is, a, is a much stronger, should we just say, than it was in 1956. Yeah, extraordinary how the Suez crisis feels so sort of relevant. Um, I mean, it's also a sort of underappreciated part of the origin of the European Union, which we may come back to in a little bit. But let's maybe um, just just talk a little more about um, about how again how the the energy and economic part of the story you tell intersect because the the in the book the energy the economic part of the story starts quite a bit later and, and you know, essentially um, around the sort of mid 1970s, um, which links back to the, um, the, um, the oil crisis of, of that time. But, but can you explain a little bit more about how you, you think um, the sort of economic uh, dynamics of the last 30, 40, 50 years um, have connected with, with you know, that, that moment and, and the energy story? Certainly. I mean, the thing about the 1970s in, in economic terms is, is that there are two really big changes. The first of them is effectively where what we've been talking about, the oil price shocks um, in that decade. The first of them around the Yom Kippur um, war um, between the Arab states and um, Israel in 1973, and the second of them around the Iranian revolution. Um, later um, in the decade. And the second seismic change is around the international financial order and the beginnings um, of the world economy as it came to be, um, in which capital could flow extraordinarily easy in vast sums over state um, borders. And, and what some were, people would call the neoliberal turn. Or yeah, and turn. there were ways in which those developments, I think, interact. Um, with each other. But in some ways, I think if we want to understand the disruptions of the last decade or so of the 2010s, we need to skip on rather and go into the, the first years of the 21st century, starting probably around 2003, 2004, um, where we begin to see what might be described as an unprecedented energy shock, and that is the shock that's coming to Western economies from Asian demand for oil in general and Chinese demand for oil um, in um, particular. And this is occurring at a time when, in part thanks to what's going on in the Middle East with the Iraq war, that the oil producers are struggling to increase their output. So what, what we see 
um, by the middle of 2008 is extraordinarily high oil prices, like at $150 um, a barrel. This story, I think, is forgotten about far too easily because they peaked in June of that year of 2008, which was just three months before the Lehman Brothers bankruptcy and, if you like, the epicenter of the financial um, crash. But I argue in, the, in disorder that these stories are very much tangled up with each other and that the, the 2008 crash is an oil crash story um, too. Uh, and that it's an important reason, the oil side of it, as to why the Western economies um, enter um, recession before the Lehman Brothers bankruptcy happens. If we then think about what happened in the 2010s and the story that we've already talked about, Hans, the shale story, the yeah. crucial thing here is, is that the shale oil boom in particular is only possible in monetary conditions that are made possible by the 2008 crash, because to begin with, in particular, uh, it's incredibly capital intensive um, shale oil extraction. And so the very low interest rates that the Federal Reserve Board or zero interest rate policy for a while anyway, that the Federal Reserve Board pursues and quantitative easing, all these, these policies basically create the credit conditions inadvertently in which the shale oil boom um, can um, take um, place. And it's not, I think, actually that surprising in a way, once you see how the monetary dynamics and the energy dynamics interact through the 2010s, that at the beginning of the pandemic, or at least the pandemic when it was hitting um, the United States, that was on North America um, and Europe, so March 2020, it's actually a, a crash in oil prices brought about by the way in which um, Mohammed bin Salman, the Saudi crown prince, reacted to what Putin had done uh, in terms of oil decision making that actually triggers the financial crash of the beginning of March 2020. So all the way through the, the 2010s, we can see the ways in which the monetary and financial um, situation and the oil situation interact um, with each other to produce some very disruptive consequences. That's fascinating. So, in other words, the 2008 crash has something to do with the energy story. It's a it's an oil crash story as well, as you say, and that's the sort of under under examined part of 2008. But that in turn brings us to the democratic part of the story, because a lot of people, um, you know, in trying to explain what's been going on in our democracies, particularly I suppose since 2016. Um, do reach back to 2008. Some people reach back even further to the neoliberal turn we discussed earlier on in terms of the growth in inequality, massive growth in inequality there's been since uh, the, the, the 1980s. Um, but in particular, as I say, a lot of people see 2008 as, as, as somehow, you know, at least indirectly uh, causing some of the democratic shocks that we had later on. Um, and you yourself at the beginning of the book, you know, in some ways, the genesis of this book does go back to 2016, doesn't it? You're trying to sort of understand some of the political disruption um, and your, uh, your explanation is a much more complex and subtle one that involves these different stories and, and the interaction um, between them. Um, but could you just maybe yeah, say a little bit about how um, you understand the sort of democratic uh, uh, sort of turbulence or disruptions that, that we've had in, in, in the last decade? In particular, I, I, get, I, and you, you, I think you imply that the, a lot of the prevalent explanations that we've had for Brexit, for Trump, in particular thinking of this in terms of populism and nationalism, is way too simplistic. You seem to be arguing against that. Could you could you explain a little bit more about 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 why you think those those narratives are are simplistic? Yeah, if we just take the the the, the basic, I think, um, premise of the populism thesis. I mean, obviously, there's not actually just one populism thesis. I'm using that as a as a shorthand. But the the argument that essentially says that what we see in 2016 and Brexit and Trump and some um, other instances is the insertion of a nasty nationalism into democratic politics, sometimes obviously described in the language of um, nativism and that there's these liberal democratic norms that have prevailed for a long time and that, that they are being um, assaulted in some um, 
respect um, by the parties that get labelled um, populist and by an individual like um, Donald um, Trump. And I think that the, the fundamental problem with that narrative is, is that it's ahistorical about the relationship between democracy and nationhood. Now, that isn't to say um, that nationalism doesn't have many dangerous forms to it, but it is to say that you can't understand the history of representative democracy. So the history that began in the end from the late 18th century French Revolution, American Constitution, the changes that then took place in Britain in the uh, in the 19th century and in um, other places, without understanding that the democratic story is running in parallel, or the emergence of representative democracy is not happening in one moment, obviously, is running in parallel um, with, if you like, if we could call it that, the age of, of, of nationalism. And this isn't a coincidence. It goes to the heart of the fact um, that in representative democracy, if the people are going to choose their representatives, who the people is, who, have the, who are the citizens who get to choose their representatives, has got to be determined. And the answer as it historically emerged as to who that people is in any instance, was in any instance, was the nation. And for a long time, actually, I think that the language of the nation, the word, sorry, the, the term the nation and the term the people were quite interchangeable um, with each other. And I actually think until the 1990s, perhaps, we can sort of, maybe argue about um, like where the juncture here lays, is, is that this was treated as kind of like, not quite 101 understanding of democratic politics, but it wasn't far off that. It was, is that um, in a democracy um, that you get the idea that people are citizens of a nation and that as citizens of a, of a nation that they choose representatives who, 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 who then the winning ones, if you like, form, form, form the government. So the idea that somehow the idea of the nation and nationalism just sort of turn out as an, come in as some kind of alien intervention in democratic politics in 2016, that never seemed to me to make you know, any, any, any sense um, at all. So that, that, and in some sense, that's perhaps a conceptual argument as well as a long history um, argument. I think the second thing I would say and I'd say this, if we just concentrate on the European countries that I talk about, which is not just Britain, but um, France and Germany and Italy primarily um, too. I think that you can see from, I would say at least 2005, um, that there, has, there is a significant problem of democratic legitimation of the European Union treaties in these countries. It manifests itself in different ways. In the, in the German case, actually, you, you, I would push, push it all the way back to 1993 in the German Constitutional Court decision about ratifying the, um, the Maastricht um, Treaty. And the crucial watershed year, I think, in this respect is 2005. Um, so three years before the crash, because that is the year when the French and Dutch voters vote down in referendum referenda, the, the constitutional treaty. And what to do about that question, what to do for the EU when the constitutional treaty is being rejected becomes a massive headache. And in the end, it's repackaged as the Lisbon Treaty and the, the message is try and keep your voters away from this, which is prevails everywhere except um, Ireland. And then when the no comes, you, you vote uh, vote again. But in very different ways, I think that that moment, the fact of how the, how the Lisbon Treaty was democratically legitimated in France and in Britain, both of them by parliamentary votes, caused really lasting consequences. Yeah. And that in, for the, for the, in, the, in, in the British case, it's a significant part of the story that ends up with Brexit. And it is because the Conservative Party, by this point led by David Cameron, was opposed to ratifying the Lisbon Treaty, it uh, it um, it wanted a referendum on the the the, the Lisbon um, Treaty. Uh, obviously, the treaty got ratified before the Conservatives came into office in two thousand and ten. No referendum um, took um, place, and then David Cameron was left trying to find some ways, in some sense, retrospectively, 
to give it democratic legitimacy. And in, in, in the tangles that he got into all that, in the end comes his, pro comes his promise to hold an in-out referendum. I would love to talk more about Brexit. I'm afraid we've already, some of the time has gone even more quickly than, than, than I thought it would. Um, maybe w w one final question though. Um, you, you talk quite a lot in the book, in, in, in talking in the democratic um, uh, story about, you use these concepts, aristocratic excess and democratic excess. I wonder if you could just explain those, because I think, it, again, it gets to the sort of um, relationship or the interaction between um, the economic and the, and the democratic uh, parts of the story. Yeah, well, I, I took these, um, th these uh, ideas from the ancient historian um, Polybius, like writing about um, the, the rise of the Roman um, Republic. And the basic idea is, is that all forms of government decay over time. They end up with problems that they aren't able to um, deal um, with. And that he argued that each form of government, so democratic form of, of government, um, is in the end um, destroyed in time by democratic excess and that aristocratic government is you know, destroyed in time by aristocratic um, excess. Uh, and the interesting question then, if we think about representative democracy is as well, it in a way has both problems because it's a form of government that mixes in some sense government of the few, which was the old, the ancient, if you like, conception of what um, aristocracy um, was, because we have government by representatives, but it also is democratic because citizens choose these representatives. So I started from the premise that that representative democracy has got the propensity to both problems. And I think it's got more of a propensity in the end to aristocratic excess than it does to democratic um, excess. And the way in which I connect I think the economic story that I'm telling with the democratic story that I'm telling is, is that from the 1970s, the, the international, the changes in the world economy ultimately lead to problems of aristocratic excess um, for um, Western countries. And in some sense, they are though made worse by the lesson that politicians take from the 1970s is, is that democracies have got a problem economically with democratic excess because they take the lesson of the 1970s to be democracies produce inflation. And because democracies produce inflation, we need to hand over monetary policy to independent central banks. And we need to worry about inflation above um, all else. And I think that that was an incorrect diagnosis of the 1970s. And that actually what it ends up doing is actually making some of the problems of aristocratic excess worse. Yeah. I would love to talk more about this um, and, you know, in particular about the EU. We didn't get to touch more on, on, on German foreign policy. Um, hopefully we'll have a, a chance to do that another time. In, in, in the meantime, um, please do buy the book. Um, it's absolutely fantastic. I think what it shows is that everything is more complicated than you thought it was. Um, and in particular, you know, our problems didn't start in, in 2016. Um, you can also discuss it uh, with us on Twitter um, using the hashtag uh, RSA Disorder. Um, and, uh, and I guess all that remains for me to do is to thank you, Helen. This was a great discussion. I wish we would have had longer, as I say. I feel, like I said at the beginning, as if we just scratched the surface. Um, but thank you, for, um, thank you for, uh, for discussing the book with me. It's been a pleasure, Hans, and I hope we can carry on talking too.